Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Bell Curve Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life by Richard J. Hernstein and Charles Murray. There is a most absurd and audacious method of reasoning avowed by some bigots and enthusiasts, and through fear assented to by some wiser and better men. It is this. They argue against a fair discussion of popular prejudices because, say they, though they would be found without any reasonable support, yet the discovery might be productive of the most dangerous consequences. Absurd and blasphemous notion, as if all happiness was not connected with the practice of virtue, which necessarily depends upon the knowledge of truth. Edmund Burke, A Vindication of Natural Society Chapter 13 Ethnic Differences in Cognitive Ability Despite the forbidding air that envelops the topic, ethnic differences in cognitive ability are neither surprising nor in doubt. Large human populations differ in many ways, both cultural and biological. It is not surprising that they might differ at least slightly in their cognitive characteristics. That they do is confirmed by the data on ethnic differences in cognitive ability from around the world. One message of this chapter is that such differences are real and have consequences. Another is that the facts are not as alarming as many people seem to fear. East Asians, for example Chinese, Japanese, whether in America or in Asia, typically earn higher scores on intelligence and achievement tests than white Americans. The precise size of their advantage is unclear. Estimates range from just a few to ten points. A more certain difference between the races is that East Asians have higher non-verbal intelligence than whites, while being equal, or perhaps slightly lower, in verbal intelligence. The difference in test scores between African Americans and European Americans, as measured in dozens of reputable studies, has converged on approximately a one standard deviation difference for several decades. Translated into centiles, this means that the average white person tests higher than about 84% of the population of blacks, and that the average black person tests higher than about 16% of the population of whites. The average black and white differ in IQ at every level of socioeconomic status, but they differ more at high levels of socioeconomic status than at low levels. Attempts to explain the difference in terms of test bias have failed. The tests have approximately equal predictive force for whites and blacks. In the past few decades, the gap between blacks and whites narrowed by perhaps three IQ points. The narrowing appears to have been mainly caused by a shrinking number of very low scores in the black population rather than an increasing number of high scores. Improvements in the economic circumstances of blacks, in the quality of the schools they attend, in better public health and perhaps also diminishing racism may be narrowing the gap. The debate about whether and how much genes and environment have to do with ethnic differences remains unresolved. The universality of the contrast in non-verbal and verbal skills between East Asians and European whites suggests, without quite proving, genetic roots. Another line of evidence pointing towards a genetic factor in cognitive ethnic differences is that blacks and whites differ most on the tests that are the best measures of G, or general intelligence. On the other hand, the scores on highly G-loaded tests can be influenced to some extent by changing environmental factors over the course of a decade or less. 
Beyond that, some social scientists have challenged the premise that intelligence tests have the same meaning for people who live in different cultural settings, or whose forebears had very different histories. Nothing seems more fearsome to many commentators than the possibility that ethnic and race differences have any genetic component at all. This belief is a fundamental error. Even if the differences between races were entirely genetic, which they are surely not, it should make no practical difference in how individuals deal with each other. The real danger is that the elite wisdom on ethnic differences that such differences cannot exist, will shift to opposite and equally unjustified extremes. Open and informed discussion is the one certain way to protect society from the dangers of one extreme view or the other. Ethnic differences in measured cognitive ability have been found since intelligence tests were invented. The battle over the meaning of these differences is largely responsible for today's controversy over intelligence testing itself. That many readers have turned first to this chapter indicates how sensitive the issue has become. Our primary purpose is to lay out a set of statements, as precise as the state of knowledge permits, about what is currently known about the size, nature, validity and persistence of ethnic differences on measures of cognitive ability. A secondary purpose is to try to induce clarity in ways of thinking about ethnic differences, for discussions about such differences tend to run away with themselves, blending issues of fact, theory, ethics, and public policy that need to be separated. The first thing to remember is that the differences among individuals are far greater than the differences between groups. If all the ethnic differences in intelligence evaporated overnight, most of the intellectual variation in America would endure. The remaining inequality would still strain the political process, because differences in cognitive ability are problematic even in ethnically homogenous societies. The chapters in Part 2, looking only at whites, should have made that clear. But the politics of cognitive inequality get hotter, sometimes too hot to handle, when they are attached to the politics of ethnicity. We believe that the best way to keep the temperature down is to work through the main facts carefully and methodically. This chapter reviews, first, the evidence bearing on ethnic differences in cognitive ability, then turns to whether the differences originate in genes or in environments. At the chapter's end, we summarise what this knowledge about ethnic differences means in practical terms. We frequently use the word ethnic rather than race, because race is such a difficult concept to employ in the American context. What does it mean to be black in America, in racial terms, when the word black, or African American, can be used for people whose ancestry is more European than African? How are we to classify a person whose parents hail from Panama, but whose ancestry is predominantly African? Is he a Latino? A black? The rule we follow here is to classify people according to the way they classify themselves. The studies of blacks or Latinos or Asians who live in America generally denote people who say they are black, Latino or Asian, no more, no less. Ethnic Nomenclature we want to call people whatever they prefer to be called, including their preferences for ethnic labels. As we write, however, there are no hard and fast rules. People from Latin America wish to be known to their national origin, Cuban American, Mexican American, Puerto Rican, and so forth. Hispanic is still the US government's official label, but Latino has gained favours in recent years. We use Latino. Opting for common usage and simplicity, we usually use black instead of African American and white, which always refers to non-Latino whites, instead of European American or Anglo. 
Americans of Asian descent are called Asian, when the context leaves no possibility of confusion with Asians living in Asia. We shift to the hyphenated versions for everyone when it would avoid such confusions or when, for stylistic reasons, the hyphenated versions seem appropriate. It would be disingenuous to leave the racial issue at that, however, for race is often on people's minds when they think about IQ. Thus, we will eventually comment on cognitive differences among races as they might derive from genetic differences, telling a story that is interesting but still riddled with more questions than answers. This prompts a second point to be understood at the outset. There are differences between races, and they are the rule, not the exception. That assertion may seem controversial to some readers, but it verges on tautology. Races are, by definition, groups of people who differ in characteristic ways. Intellectual fashion has dictated that all differences must be denied except the absolutely undeniable differences in appearance, but nothing in biology says this should be so. On the contrary, race differences are varied and complex, and they make the human species more adaptable and more interesting. The Tested Intelligence of Asians, Blacks and Whites So much for preliminaries. Answers to commonly asked questions about the ethnic groups in America follow, beginning with the basics and moving into successively more complicated issues. The black-white difference receives by far the most detailed examination because it, is, because it is the most controversial and has the widest social ramifications. But the most common question we have asked in recent years has not been about blacks but about Asians, as Americans have watched the spectacular economic success of the Pacific Rim nations at a distance and, closer to home, become accustomed to seeing Asian immigrant children collecting top academic honours in America's schools. Do Asians have higher IQs than whites? Probably, yes, if Asian refers to the Japanese and Chinese, and perhaps also Koreans, whom we refer to here as East Asians. How much higher is still unclear. Richard Lin, a leading scholar of racial and ethnic differences, has reviewed the assembled data on overall Asian IQ in two major articles. In his 1991 review of the literature, he put the median IQ for the studies of Chinese living in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan and China proper at 110. The median IQ for the studies of Japanese living in Japan at 103 and the median for studies of East Asians living in North America at 103. But as Lin acknowledges, these comparisons are imprecise because the IQs are not corrected for changes that have been observed over time in national IQ averages. In Lin's 1987 compilation, where such corrections were made, the medians for both Chinese and the Japanese were 103. Mean, white American IQ is typically estimated as 101 to 102. Additional studies of Chinese in Hong Kong, conducted by J.W.C. Chan using the Raven's Standard Progressive Matrices, a non-verbal test that is an especially good measure of G, found IQ equivalence in the region of 110 for both elementary and secondary school students, compared to about 100 for whites living in Hong Kong. Another study post-dating Lin's review compared representative samples of South Korean and British nine-year-olds and found an IQ difference of nine points. The most extensive compilation of East Asian cognitive performance in North America, by Philip Vernon, included no attempt to strike an overall estimate for the current gap between the races, but he did draw conclusions about East Asian white differences in verbal and non-verbal abilities, which we will describe later in the chapter. 
In addition to studies of abilities, Vernon compiled extensive data on the schoolwork of East Asians, documenting their superior performance by a variety of measures ranging from grades to the acquisition of the PhD. Is this superior performance caused by superior IQ? James Flynn has argued that the real explanation for the success of Asian Americans is that they are overachievers. He also says that Asian Americans actually have the same non-verbal intelligence as whites and a fractionally lower verbal intelligence. Richard Lynn disagrees and concludes from the same data used by Flynn that there is an ethnic difference in overall IQ as well. The NLSY is not much help on the issue. The sample contained only 42 East Asians, Chinese, Japanese and Koreans. Their mean IQ was 106, compared to the European-American white mean of 103, consistent with the evidence that East Asians have a higher IQ than whites, but based on such a small sample that not much can be made of it. The indeterminacy of the debate is predictable. The smaller the IQ difference, the more questionable its reality. And this has proved to be the case with the East Asian white difference. It is difficult enough to find two sets of subjects within a single city who can be compared without problems of interpretation. Can one compare test scores obtained in different years with different tests for students of different ages in different cultural settings drawn from possibly different socio-economic populations. One answer is that it can be done through techniques that take advantage of patterns observed over many studies. Lin, in particular, has responded to each new critique, in some cases providing new data, in others refining earlier estimates, and always pointing to the striking similarity of the results despite the disparity of the tests and settings. But given the complexities of cross-national comparisons, the issue must eventually be settled by a sufficient body of data obtained from identical tests administered to populations that are comparable except for race. We have been able to identify three such efforts. In one, Samples of American, British and Japanese students aged 13 to 15 were administered a test of abstract reasoning and spatial relations. The American and British samples had scores within a point of the standardised mean of 100 on both the abstract and spatial relations components of the test. The Japanese adolescents scored 104.5 on the test for abstract reasoning and 114 on the test for spatial relations, a large difference, amounting to a gap similar to the one found by Vernon for Asians in America. In a second set of studies, nine-year-olds in Japan, Hong Kong and Britain, drawn from comparable socio-economic populations, were administered the Raven's Standard Progressive Matrices. The children from Hong Kong averaged 113, from Japan, 110, and from Britain, 100. A gap of well over half a standard deviation between both the Japanese and Hong Kong samples and a British one equated for age and socioeconomic status. The third set of studies, directed by Harold Stevenson, administered a battery of mental tests to elementary school children in Japan, Taiwan, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. The key difference between this study and the other two is that Stevenson and his colleagues carefully matched the children on socioeconomic and demographic variables. No significant difference in overall IQ was found, and Stevenson and colleagues concluded that, quote, this study offers no support for the argument that there are differences in general cognitive functioning of Chinese, Japanese and American children. Close quote. Where does this leave us? The parties in the debate are often individually confident, and you will find in their articles many flat statements that an overall East Asian white IQ difference does or does not exist. We will continue to hedge. 
Harold Stevenson and his colleagues have convinced us that matching subjects by socioeconomic status can reduce the difference to near zero. But he has not convinced us that matching by socioeconomic status is a good idea if one wants to know an estimate of the overall difference between East Asians and whites. We will return to the question of matching by socioeconomic status when we discuss comparisons between blacks and whites. In our judgment, the balance of the evidence supports the proposition that the overall East Asian mean is higher than the white mean. If we had to put a number on it, three IQ points currently most resembles a consensus, tentative though it still is. East Asians have a greater advantage than that in a particular kind of non-verbal intelligence described later in the chapter. Jews, Latinos and Gender In the text we focus on three major racial ethnic groupings, whites, East Asians and blacks, because they have dominated both the research and contentions regarding intelligence. But whenever the subject of group differences in IQ comes up, three other questions are sure to be asked. Are Jews really smarter than everyone else? Where do Latinos fit in compared to whites and blacks? What about women versus men? Jews, specifically Ashkenazi Jews of European origins, test higher than any other ethnic group. A fair estimate seems to be that Jews in America and Britain have an overall IQ mean somewhere between a half and a full standard deviation above the mean, with the source of the difference concentrated in the verbal component. In the NLSY, 98 whites with IQ scores identified themselves as Jews. The NLSY did not try to ensure representatives within ethnic groups other than blacks and Latinos, so we cannot be sure that the 98 Jews in the sample are nationally representative. But it is at least worth noting that their mean IQ was 0.97 standard deviation above the mean for the rest of the population, and 0.84 standard deviation above the mean of whites who identified themselves as Christian. These test results are matched by analyses of occupational and scientific attainment by Jews, which consistently show their disproportionate level of success, usually by orders of magnitude in various inventories of scientific and artistic achievement. The term Latino embraces people with highly disparate cultural heritage and a wide range of racial stocks. Many of these groups are known to differ markedly in their social and economic profiles. Add to that the problem of possible language difficulties with the tests, and generalizations about IQ become especially imprecise for Latinos. With that in mind, it may be said that their test results generally fall about half and one standard deviation below the national mean. In the NLSY, the disparity with whites was 0.93 standard deviation. This may be compared to an overall average difference of 0.84 standard deviation between whites and Mexican-Americans found in the 1960s on the tests used in the famous Coleman reports described in Chapter 17. We will have more to say about the interpretation of Latino scores with regard to possible language bias in Chapter 14. When it comes to gender, the consistent story has been that men and women have nearly identical mean IQs, but that men have a broader distribution. In the NLSY, for example, women had a mean on the Armed Forces Qualification Test that was 0 0.06 standard deviation lower than the male mean and a standard deviation that was 0 0.11 narrower. For the Wetzler Intelligence Scale for Children, the average boy tests 1.8 IQ points higher than the average girl, and boys have a standard deviation that is 0.8 points larger than girls. The larger variation among men 
means that there are more men than women at either extreme of the IQ distribution. Do blacks score differently from whites on standardised tests of cognitive ability? If the samples are chosen to be representative of the American population, the answer has to be yes for every known test of cognitive ability that meets basic psychometric standards of reliability and validity. The answer is also yes for almost all of the studies in which the black and white samples are matched on some special characteristic, samples of juvenile delinquents, for example, or of graduate students. But there are exceptions. The implication of this effect of selecting the groups to be compared is discussed later in the chapter. Since black-white differences are the ones that strain discourse most severely, we will probe deeply into the evidence and its meaning. How large is the black-white difference? The usual answer to this question is one standard deviation. In discussing IQ tests, for example, the black mean is commonly given as 85, while the white mean is 100, and the standard deviation as 15. But the differences observed in any given study seldom conform exactly to one standard deviation. The figure below shows the distribution of the black-white difference, subsequently abbreviated as the BW difference, expressed in standard deviations in the American studies conducted in this century that have reported the IQ means of a black sample and a white sample and meet basic requirements of interpretability as described in the note. A total of 156 studies are represented in the plot, and the mean black-white difference is 1.08 standard deviations, or about 16 IQ points. The spread of the results is substantial, however, reflecting the diversity of the age of the subjects, their geographic location, their background characteristics, the tests themselves, and sampling error. When we focus on the studies that meet stricter criteria, the range of values for the black-white difference narrows accordingly. The range of results is considerably reduced, for example, for studies that have taken place since 1940, after testing's most formative period, outside the South, where the largest black-white differences are found, with subjects older than the age of six, after scores have become more stable, using full test batteries from one of the major IQ tests and with standard deviations reported for that specific test administration. Of the 45 studies meeting these criteria, all but nine of the black-white differences are clustered between 0.5 and 1.5 standard deviations. The mean difference was 1.06 standard deviations, and all but eight of the 31 reported a black-white difference greater than 0.8 standard deviation. Still more rigorous selection criteria do not diminish the size of the gap. For example, the tests given outside the South only after 1960, when people were increasingly sensitised to racial issues, the number of studies is reduced to tw 24, but the mean difference is 1.1 standard deviations. The NLSY administered in 1980 to by far the largest sample, 6,502 whites and 3,022 blacks, in a national study, found a difference of 1.21 standard deviations on the AFQT. Computing the black-white difference. The simplest way to compute the black-white difference when limited information is available is to take the two means and to compare them using the standard deviation for the reference population, defined in this case as whites. This is how the differences in the figure on page 277 showing the results of 156 studies were computed. When all the data are available, however, 
as in the case of the NLSY, a more accurate method is available, which takes into account the standard deviations within each population and the relative size of the samples. The equation is given in the note. Unless otherwise specified, all of the subsequent expressions of the black-white differences are based on this method. For more about scoring of IQs in the NLSY, see Appendix 2. Answering the question, how large is the difference, in terms of standard deviations, does not convey an intuitive sense of the size of the gap. A rough and ready way of thinking about the size of the gap is to recall that one standard deviation above and below the mean cuts off the 84th and 16th percentiles of a normal distribution. In the case of the black-white difference of 1.2 standard deviations found in the NLSY, a person with the black mean was in the 11th percentile of the white distribution, and a person with the white mean was in the 91st percentile of the black distribution. A difference of this magnitude should be thought of in several different ways, each with its own important implications. Recall first that the American black population numbers more than 30 million people. If the results from the NLSY apply to the total black population of the 1990s, around 100,000 blacks fall into class 1 of our five cognitive classes, with IQs of 125 or higher. 100,000 people is a lot of people. It should be no surprise to see, as one does every day, blacks functioning at high levels in every intellectually challenging field. It is important to understand as well that a difference of 1.2 standard deviations means considerable overlap in the cognitive ability distribution for blacks and whites, as shown for the NLSY population in the figure below. For any equal number of blacks and whites, a large portion have IQs that can be matched up. This is the distribution to keep in mind whenever thinking about individuals. But an additional complication has to be taken into account. In the United States, there are about six whites for every black. This means that the IQ overlap of the two populations, as they actually exist in the United States, looks very different from the overlap in the figure just above. The next figure presents the same data from the NLSY, when the distributions are shown in proportion to the actual population of young people represented in the NLSY. This figure shows why black-white difference can be problematic in American society as a whole. For the lower end of the IQ range, there are approximately equal numbers of blacks and whites, but throughout the upper half of the range, the disproportions between the number of whites and blacks at any given IQ level are huge to the extent that the difference represents an authentic difference in cognitive functioning, the social consequences are potentially huge as well. But is the difference authentic? Are the differences in black and white scores attributable to cultural bias or other artefacts of the test? Appendix 5 contains a discussion of the state of knowledge regarding test bias. Here, we shall quickly review the basic findings regarding blacks without repeating the citations in Appendix 5, which we urge you to read. External evidence of bias. Tests are used to predict things, most commonly to predict performance in school or on the job. Chapter 3 discussed this issue in detail. You will recall that the ability of the test to predict is known as its validity. A test with high validity predict, predicts accurately. A test with poor validity makes many mistakes. Now suppose that a test's validity differs for the members of two groups. To use a concrete example, the SAT is used as a tool in college admissions because it has certain validity in predicting college performance. If the SAT is biased against blacks, it will underpredict their college performance. 
if tests were biased in this way, blacks as a group would do better in college than the admissions office expected based on just their SATs. It would be as if the test underestimated the true SAT score of the blacks, and so the natural remedy for this kind of bias would be to compensate the black applicants by, for example, adding the appropriate number of points onto their scores. Predictive bias can work in another way, as when the test is simply less reliable, that is, less accurate, for blacks than for whites. Suppose a test used to select police sergeants is more accurate in predicting the performance of white candidates who become sergeants than in predicting the performance of black sergeants. It doesn't underpredict for blacks, but rather fails to predict at all, or predicts less accurately. In these cases, the natural remedy would be to give less weight to the test scores of blacks than to those of whites. The key concept for both types of bias are the same. A test biased against blacks does not predict black performance in the real world in the same way that it predicts white performance in the real world. The evidence of bias is external in the sense that it shows up in differing validities for blacks and whites. External evidence of bias has been sourced in hundreds of studies. It has been evaluated relative to performance in elementary school, in secondary school, in the university, in the armed forces, in unskilled and skilled jobs, in the professions. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is that the major standardised tests used to help make school and job decisions do not underpredict black performance, nor does the expert community find any other general or symptomatic difference in the predictive accuracy of tests for blacks and whites. Internal evidence of bias. Predictive validity is the ultimate criterion for bias because it involves the proof of the pudding for any test. But although predictive validity is in a technical sense the decisive issue, our impression from talking about this issue with colleagues and friends is that other types of potential bias loom larger in their imaginations. The many things that are put under the umbrella label of cultural bias. The most common charges of cultural bias involve the putative cultural loading of items in a test. Here is an SAT analogy item that has become famous as an example of cultural bias. Runner, marathon, A, envoy, Embassy. B. Martyr. Massacre. C. Oarsman. Regatta. D. Referee. Tournament. E. Horse. Stable. The answer is Oarsman Regatta. Fairly easy if you know what both a marathon and a regatta are. A matter of guesswork otherwise. How would a black youngster from the inner city ever have heard of a regatta? Many view such items as proof that the tests must be biased against people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Clearly, writes a critic of testing, citing this example, this item does not measure students' aptitude or logical reasoning ability but knowledge of upper-middle-class recreational activity. In the language of psychometrics, this is called internal evidence of bias, as contrasted with the external evidence of differential prediction. The hypothesis of bias again lends itself to direct examination. In effect, the SAT critic is saying that culturally loaded terms are producing at least some of the black-white difference. Get rid of such items and the gap will narrow. Is he correct? When we look at the results for items that have answers such as Oarsman Regatta, and the results for items that seem to be empty of any cultural information, 
repeating a sequence of numbers, for example, are there any differences? Are differences in group test scores concentrated among certain items? The technical literature is again clear. In study after study of the leading tests, the hypothesis that the black-white difference is caused by questions with cultural context has been contradicted by the facts. Items that the average white test taker finds easy relative to other items, the average black test taker does not. The same is true for items that the average white and black find difficult. Inasmuch as whites and blacks have different overall scores on average, it follows that a smaller proportion of blacks get right answers for either easy or hard items, but the order of difficulty is virtually the same in each racial group. For groups that have special language considerations, Latinos and American Indians, for example, some internal evidence of bias has been found, unless English is their native language. Studies comparing blacks and whites on various kinds of IQ tests find that the black-white difference is not created by items that ask about regattas or who wrote Hamlet, or any of the other similar examples cited in criticisms of tests. How can this be? The explanation is complicated and goes deep into the reasons why a test is good or bad in measuring intelligence. Here, we restrict ourselves to the conclusion the black-white difference is wider on items that appear to be culturally neutral than on items that appear to be culturally loaded. We italicise this point because it, is, because it is both so well established empirically yet comes as such a surprise to most people who are new to this topic. We will elaborate on this finding later in the chapter. In any case, there is no longer an important technical debate over the conclusion that the cultural content of a test is not the cause of group differences in scores. Motivation to try Suppose that the nature of cultural bias does not lie in predictive validity or in the content of the items, but in what might be called test willingness. A typical black youngster, it is hypothesized, comes to such tests with a mindset different from the white subjects. He is less attuned to testing situations, from one point of view, or less inclined to put up with such nonsense from another. Perhaps he just doesn't give a damn, since he has no hopes of going to college or otherwise benefiting from a good test score. Perhaps he figures that the test is biased against him anyway, so what's the point? Perhaps he consciously refuses to put out his best effort because of the peer pressure against acting white, in some inner-city schools. The studies that have attempted to measure motivation in such situations have generally found that blacks are at least as motivated as whites. But these are not wholly convincing, for why shouldn't the measures of motivation be just as inaccurate as the measures of cognitive ability are alleged to be? Analysis of internal characteristics of the tests once again offers the best leverage in examining this broad hypothesis. Two sets of data seem especially pertinent. The first involves the digit span subtest, part of the widely used Wechsler intelligence tests. It has two forms, forward digit span, in which the subject tries to repeat a sequence of numbers in the order read to him, and backward digit span, in which the subject tries to repeat the sequence of numbers backwards. The test is simple in concept, uses numbers that are familiar to everyone, and calls on no cultural information besides knowing numbers. The digit span is especially informative regarding test motivation, not just because of the low cultural loading of the items, but because the backward form is twice as G-loaded as the forward form. It is a much better measure of general intelligence. 
The reason is that reversing the numbers is mentally more demanding than repeating them in the heard order, as readers can determine for themselves by a little self-testing. The two parts of the subtest have identical content. They occur at the same time during each test. Each subject does both. But in most studies, the black-white distance is about twice as great on backward digits as on forward digits. The question arises, how can a lack of motivation, or test willingness, or any other explanation of that type, explain the difference in performance on the two parts of the same subtest? A similar question arises from work on reaction time. Several psychometricians, led by Arthur Jensen, have been exploring the underlying nature of G by hypothesizing that neurologic processing speed is implicated, akin to the speed of a microprocessor in a computer. Smarter people process faster than less smart people. The strategy for testing the hypothesis is to give people extremely simple cogn cognitive tasks, so simple that no conscious thought is involved, and to use precise timing methods to determine how fast different people perform these tasks. One commonly used apparatus involves a console with a semicircle of eight lights, each with a button next to it. In the middle of the console is the home button. At the beginning of each trial, the subject is depressing the home button with his finger. One of the lights on the semicircle goes on. The subject moves his finger to the button closest to the light, which turns it off. There are more complicated versions of the task. Three lights go on, and the subject moves to the one that is farthest from the other two, for example. But none requires much thought, and everybody gets the trial right. The subject's response speed is broken into two measures, reaction time, RT, the time it takes the subject to lift his finger from the home button after the target light goes on, and movement time, MT, the time it takes to move the finger from just above the home button to the target button. Francis Galton, in the 19th century, believed that reaction time is associated with intelligence, but could not prove it. He was on the right track after all. In modern studies, reaction time is correlated with the results of full-scale IQ tests. Even more specifically, it is correlated with the G factor in IQ tests. In some studies, only with the G factor. Movement time is much less correlated with IQ or with G. This makes sense. Most of the cognitive processing has been completed by the time the finger leaves the home button. The rest is mostly a function of small motor skills. Research on reaction time is doing much to advance our understanding of the biological basis of G. For our purposes here, however, it also offers a test for the motivation hypothesis. The consistent result of many studies is that white reaction time is faster than black reaction time, but black movement time is faster than white movement time. One can imagine the unmotivated subject who thinks the reaction time test is a waste of time and does not try very hard. But the level of motivation, whatever it may be, seems likely to be the same for the measures of RT and MT. The question arises, how can one be unmotivated to do well during one split second of a test, but apparently motivated during the next split second? Results of this sort argue against easy explanations that appeal to differences in motivation as explanatory of the black-white difference. Uniform background bias. Other kinds of bias discussed in Appendix 5 include the possibility that blacks have less access to coaching than whites, less experience with tests, 
less test-wiseness, poorer understanding of standard English, and that their performance is affected by white examiners. Each of these hypotheses has been investigated for many tests under many conditions. None has been sustained. In short, the testable hypothesis have led towards the conclusion that cognitive ability tests are not biased against blacks. This leaves one final hypothesis regarding cultural bias that does not lend itself to empirical ev evaluation, at least not directly. Suppose our society is so steeped in the conditions that produce test bias that people in disadvantaged groups underscore their cognitive abilities on all the items on tests, thereby hiding the internal evidence of bias. At the same time and for the same reasons, they underperform in school and on the job in relation to their true abilities, thereby hiding the external evidence. In other words, the tests may be biased against disadvantaged groups, but the traces of bias are invisible because the bias permeates all areas of the group's performance. Accordingly, it would be as useless to look for evidence of test bias as it would be for Einstein's imaginary person travelling near the speed of light to try to determine whether time has slowed. Einstein's traveller has no clock that exists independent of his space-time context. In assessing test bias, we would have no test or criterion measure that exists independent of this culture and its history. This form of bias would pervade everything. To some readers, the hypothesis will seem so plausible that it is self-evidently correct. Before deciding that this must be the explanation for group differences in test scores, however, a few problems must be overcome. First, the comments about the digit span and reaction time results apply here as well. How can this uniform background bias suppress performance on backward digit span more than forward digit span? Second, the hypothesis implies that many of the performance yardsticks in the society at large are not only biased, they are all so similar in the degree to which they distort the truth in every occupation, every type of educational institution, every achievement measure, every performance measure, that no differential distortion is picked up by the data. Is this plausible? It is not good enough to accept without question that a general background radiation of bias, uniform and ubiquitous, explains away black and white differences in test scores and performance measures. The hypothesis might, in theory, be true, but given the degree to which everyday experience suggests that the environment confronting blacks in different sectors of American life is not uniformly hostile, and given the consistency in results from a wide variety of cognitive measures, assuming that the hypothesis is true represents a considerably longer leap of faith than the much more limited assumption that race prejudice is still a factor in American life. In the matter of test bias, this brings us to the frontier of knowledge.